The following program contains adult language. Nightcap. Conversations on the arts and letters. With hosts, Sud Turkle and Calvin Trillin. Nightcap. Tonight's guests are Isaac Asimov, renowned scientist, teacher, and author, whose works of best-selling science fiction include The Foundation Trilogy and I, Robot. Harlan Ellison, the award-winning writer of A Boy and His Dog, has scripted episodes as well for Star Trek, The Outer Limits, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Gene Wolfe, two-time winner of the coveted Nebula Award whose recently completed tetralogy, The Book of the New Sun, is already being hailed as a classic. <laughs> well, this is where the sister we don't drink, we don't use dope, we don't have homosexual... I was going to say, I'm right. Stead Turkle, my I friend Calvin <laughs> Budtrill and I are interested in science fiction writing tonight. Uh, that, that label may be inadequate to describe the imaginative writings of our guests. What is the... Uh, Stud, insidious. Are you really dislike the, the term science fiction, or is it fair to say hate? I think the word. I, I think loathe with an intensity <laughs> and loathe of the history of the human race. Right, so not Harlan. fond of what? it. What? Why? Because I don't write science fiction. Isaac writes science fiction. Isaac can be justly called a science fiction writer. I write what Poe wrote, what Kafka wrote. I write. I write a kind of of of, of surreal fantasy, but the can't put surreal fantasy on a paperback. The term science fiction is an utterly meaningless categorization that is used for the benefit of book dealers, so that they know to put all the books with women in grass reserves being molested by green bug-eyed monsters over there, and all the ones with guys in stepsons over there, and all the nurses looking at interns over there. Is that what he writes? No. <laughs> the stuff no. With, the stuff with he the writes green eyed monsters. You write science fiction, Gene? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, what's the, the difference the woman between the unicorn the term doesn't offend you. What comes to Isaac? No Isaac, what about yourself? I love it. I love it. That's what I grew up reading and writing, and I'm very broad-minded about the term science fiction. I'll include under science fiction everything that Harlan wants. I'll it's... get you later. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that uh, my own personal feeling is that the best kind of science fiction involves science. Ah, so what you're really talking about is good writing and bad writing, aren't you? No, I mean, you don't no care what you're not talking no, about no, it. No. As a, you don't you don't object to it because you think it's it's a term that denigrates the form. You object to it because you don't think that that particular thing is what you happen to be writing. Exactly. It's, I'm right. talking about this for me. Yeah. For me, only. For instance, I've got a publisher now who has just brought back 13 of my books. One of which is a rock novel about the 1950s. One of them is a novel about juvenile delinquency when I ran with Kid Yang in Brooklyn. Another one is, is two books of TV essays, the last hit, the other glass hit. i got science fiction on them. I've just had to enjoin them. I've had to have an injunction sent to them to stop them. The morons think that people who read science fiction are going to buy these books. When they buy a rock novel, they're going to get crazy. And, and they, they, it's, being, it's forcing a writer and many writers who don't like that into the category for the convenience of marketers. That's what right. I object to. Do you also object to having... I mean, when, when you all write books, or at least I know you write some different sorts of things, but when you write books that can roughly be in that category, do you object to the idea that it is a kind of a genre, that, 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 that here are the mysteries, here are the science fiction, here are the westerns? I don't. I don't. To my way of thinking, we've got a built-in and loyal audience. I write in addition to science fiction, mysteries, and non-fiction. And it frequently happens that some lazy book dealer puts my nonfiction into the science fiction group because he sees my name on it. Doesn't bother me because the people who are going to buy me in science fiction will buy my nonfiction books if they see it also. And I figure this is a way of reaching my audience. Science right. fiction is a code word for Isaac's audience. Yeah, this so is I don't positive mind. thinking here. You said one of your books you would call it science fiction. What would you call the ones that aren't? <laughs> That's as good a name as I've ever come the up with. The ones that aren't. Uh, I also write science fantasy. That's what I call it. Uh, you were Give me a science, science fantasy plot and a science fiction plot. How there, would, there would be the same plot, which I, I'll explain to okay. you in a moment. Uh, studs ask about, are we really talking about good writing? 
And everybody said, no, correctly. That's not what we're talking about. What we're really talking about are wire racks. Wire racks in bookstores, right? okay? Harlan Ellison is a big Indian. He is up at the front of the bookstore in a big Indian wire rack, where he wants to be. Isaac is a little Indian. He is at the back of the bookstore in a different set of wire racks. I'm in the same set of wire racks with Isaac, but it doesn't bother me all that much. I don't think I would sell 20,000 copies in hardcover. Yeah, but you should. Honest. I should. You well, wait, better now, believe it. So now you're talking. Not, I'm sorry, interrupting you. That's all right. Going to explain that. Go ahead. I'd now rather you, listen to your okay. interruption. Now you're talking not about good writing, but about commerce. That's what we're talking, talking about. about we're commerce. Talking. That's it. That's, right. this about is, this commodities is and not about literature. Right. 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 You're, you're, you're talking about marketing, really. Yeah. How your books are presented to the public, either by promotion people or by the book designers or by the, the person who decides That's what which book. Yes. About. Now, what, what I'm asking is, is what, how would a layman know the difference between science fiction and, say, science fantasy? Now, let me tell you. All let right. I, I write a series of stories, not many so far, but a series about a fellow who had, makes contact with a little demon about two centimeters high. Now, I don't have to explain the demon. He can do all sorts of things we can't, and I write funny stories about him. Uh, that's fantasy. But I can't do that. Inevitably, I have to explain that the demon is an extraterrestrial with an advanced, with advanced level of science and technology, and I go to the trouble that when he makes a person lovable, it's not because he's done magic, but because he's fiddled with his biochemistry and produced some pheromones, which women smell, and without knowing it, just fall in love. Uh -huh. And that becomes science fiction. Now, if you tied it really literally to science. That's right. Uh -huh. And if you're sufficiently ingenious, and if you know your science sufficiently well, you can do it. So now we come to you three, who are obviously very deft practitioners. You you're also... You're prophetic, you know. I mean, the fact is, the world itself today has, in a sense, caught up with some of the stuff you've been imagining. No, that's horse puppy, kid. Huh? That's, that's, that's bullshit. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Look, when science fiction first began as a separate genre in the century, 1921, yeah. it, w it, it came into being almost by accident. It was a fluke. A guy named Hugo Gernsback started using stories in, in yeah. science experimenter magazines. But it was looked on as such a bastard child of literature that people were ashamed of it. And then after a very few years, they were, they were doing magazines with ladies in brass brassieres. And the kids who were reading these, who loved them, were ashamed to have them, so they would hide them inside a National mm. Geographic, where you had ladies without any brass brassieres. But that's one, another story. Yeah. And, and so the one thing that they could say that validated the reading of science fiction is, well, we predict the future. Ah. Look at Jules Verne predicted the submarine, and Gernsback predicted night baseball. That's horse manure. Because there's 9,000 writers all shotgunning and predicting everything in the world. So, of course, every once in a while, they yeah. hit something. But even Isaac will admit that as recently as, what, 1960, I guess, when Heinlein, or was it 60 when Heinlein did the man who sold the moon? Mm, yes. 1960, even Robert Heinlein, who was really sharp in this kind of area, he predicted the whole wrong way that we were going to get to the moon. He thought mm. people were going to, you know, big business and people were going to build it in the backyard and send it to the moon. He had no idea that it was going to be government and NASA doing it. Yeah, my favorite example is yeah. the science fiction writers talked about going to the moon, yeah. and they talked about television. And not one, not one, ever had us reach the moon while people on Earth watched on television. Oh, right. yeah. Never made oh, the connection. It's very tough in a science fiction story to have more than one thing that people won't really believe in. And so if you're thinking television, you're thinking moon landing at a time when nobody believes in either of those things, you don't have somebody televising a moon landing because it won't sell. Probably somebody wrote that story with the television on the moon. Nobody bought it back then. Uh, I mean, they're talking to, you're straining the. I mean, they can they can set aside their their uh, system of uh, reality to a certain extent, but after that, it, 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 it's overloaded. I mean, you can't. If you if you have Wonderland, you have Alice in it, right. because everybody knows Alice Little, right? If you have uh, a very strange character, E.T then E.T. comes down in some California suburbia. Uh, I was reading Isaac, who is much, much older than I am, despite our offense, uh, <laughs> at the time that uh, the bomb was dropped. By the way, my physicist friend became a nuclear physicist because I gave him a 
box of old astounding that my mother was making me throw, throw away. That's what he said. Who believes? Uh, but I knew. I had I had read all this stuff, and I knew what an atomic bomb meant. It meant that by the time I was an elderly man of 35 or so, we would have atomic-powered space travel, and there would be a Pax America all over the world. Because when we had atomic weapons, nobody would dare give us any problems. And I got that from him. And I liked it much better than what I got from this. I actually got it from Heinlein. I was trying to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> no so you mean it's gone it. beyond what science fiction writers have ways. in mind. And in some ways, it'll never catch up. Yeah. Because some of the things we talk a lot about in science fiction are actually scientifically impossible, even theoretically. I think that time travel, like sitting in a machine and turning knobs, right. is actually theoretically impossible. But I wouldn't give that up. It's a very valuable plot yeah. given. But there is... I'm sorry, you were going to say something. I was going to say, my, my oldest friend is a nuclear physicist. Yeah. He wrote me a letter six months ago that had one of the greatest sentences in it I have ever read. And it said... This is no kidding. The man of the nuclear physicist at the University of Washington, Seattle. He said, my time reversal experiments are proceeding more slowly than I had hoped. <laughs> I wrote it. You're doing it! You're going to do it! You know, it leads to something, and I pulled it out. Something Harlem said, and there's something Isaac said. And I did pull this out, and suddenly hit me. Hey, you guys are more than science fiction writers, the phrase you hate, or more than magic realistic writers, the phrase you like. But here, this is... Harlem, 2001 showed that we hold the stars in our hands, quoting Harlem Ellis. We have always held the stars in our hands. There is no God, we are God. That the species capable of painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling and producing Moby Dick is not a species that should contend us with Harold Robbins' novels, McDonald's, and Jonestown. It's the love-hate relationship that I have with the human race. I am an elitist, and here's the part. I feel that my responsibility is to drag the human race along with me. I never pander to or speak down to or play the safe game. Because, and he dramatically, melodramatically, being hard on, of course, because my mortal soul will be lost. But this is fascinating to me. What you're saying is a certain standard of behavior, too. Aesthetic and ethical. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm horrified by the human race and at the same time awed by it. As, as, as seven women outside the, the, the Illinois state legislature starve themselves and fast in defense of the Equal Rights Amendment, which, whether you believe in the ERA or not, is, is an incredible demonstration of human courage. 37 days, they've endangered their life. As they did that, on the one side, human courage, in front of them, women stood eating Milky Way bars. And other women carried signs that said, death to the ERA sluts. And men came and sat up a banquet table, set up a banquet table and ate in front of these women as they sat in their wheelchairs. And, 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 and we're, we're suffering. Uh, right there is a, is a paradigm for the human race. Uh, fascinating, endlessly fascinating, but at one and the same time uh, ennobled, ennobled and, 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 and degraded. And, and I see my job uh, as, a, as, a, as one who, who tries to view what Faulkner said. What I write is the study of the human heart in conflict with itself, which is the only thing worth writing about. It's the only thing worth the blood and the sweat of the, of the act. These guys, in writing the imaginative literature they write, are really moralists, too. And they're saying, we can be a hell of a lot better than we are. Something that, do I romanticize? No, nope, isn't this what you're saying, really? Well, uh, yes. I, I got a letter from someone who told me that, contrary to what I had said in an article I wrote, he thought that human beings were essentially bad. And all of them, except for the grace of God, were due to go to hell. And I answered that I thought that people's view of the human race was that which they recognized in themselves. I think the human race is essentially good until it is perverted. You know what's crazy about this? I just experienced an epiphanic moment. Uh -oh. And here it is. Um, <laughs> you two guys are exactly the opposite of a man who has taken a seriously to scientist, Conrad Lorenz, who is very good with non-humans. But it's like the human race. That man is basically aggressive, and he's taken seriously as writing about humans, and so are his disciples who popularized him, Robert Ardrey and, uh, and uh, Desmond Morris. Now, they're serious. Critics take them seriously because they say man's no goddamn good, really. 
You guys demand its possibilities, and you're not taken seriously. I think it's rather interesting. You, you, you know, I'm constantly being assaulted by people who can't understand when, I, when I'm, in, I'm so much in favor of civil rights and so much in favor of the ERA and things like that, that I'm not crazy uh, uh, about nuclear fission uh, and, and, and nuclear power. And, and, and they say, we're going to blow ourselves up. I mean, these are usually providence who tell me this. And I say to them, look, for the first time, with one exception, in the history of the human race, we have a weapon, and no one uses it. No one uses it. For over 30 years, we have had the ability, and a lot of nutsos have had it. Idi Amin, who is, you know, genuinely screwball, he had the bomb. No one has used it. This is a kind of reticence on the part of the human race that is virtually unparalleled. That gives me great hope. It makes me feel very good about the human race. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, you does feel terrible. <laughs> now I'm, I'm scared. Of course, he didn't know he'd be on me. Now he feels a lot worse than he did when he came in. What are your thoughts, Brother Wolf? I'm hearing this. Are you uh, as, what? when I call them more, I don't mean that they have doctrinaire platforms, obviously not, but there's something. You a, I was a, you a, not amoral, but a political on this? Or what? I'm not, is, is the question being, I guess, whether mankind is good or bad. I think first you have to decide what good or bad is. Uh, I am uh, a Catholic, like a real Catholic, a church-going, mass-attending Catholic. You haven't got a prayer, kid. And uh, <laughs> well, you you said that there, there were that mankind was the only god, and then you said that people were going to lose their souls. I noticed that too. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I happen to, to believe that there is a god, and I happen to believe that people are capable of choice. This is the doctrine of free will. Uh, you can be a son of a bitch, motherfucker, whatever you want. Uh, you can be a saint, maybe, if you try terribly, terribly hard or get terribly, terribly lucky. Uh, I think that both people are right. I think Conrad Lawrence is right. I think Harlan mm. Ellison is right. You mean right. that man's capable of both? Yes. Either. And yeah. both are in them. Are these views, you think, reflected in, in your work? Oh, I mean, certainly. People, I mean, people certainly. read... Read. But there, this is an old idea. There's a Scandinavian witch who is a beautiful woman in front. Harlan will know what she's called. I don't know. And in back is like a rotten tree. Uh, that goes Maybe. back yeah. 1,200, 1,400 years at least. Uh, that is mankind. Uh, the witch is us. Uh, when you, you get to the, the central chamber in the Emerald City and you snatch aside the curtain, you always find that the guy there is from Kansas. You know, God you're is saying, You're saying this Auschwitz and Martin Luther King. Uh, there's Hiroshima and Gandhi. In both. In Christ. So I, both. I hope you don't mean that it would have been better if we dropped Gandhi on here. No, I'm saying the two, <laughs> the good and the bad. Yeah, yeah, I told you he was very strange. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he has the weirdest for you. mind. Of What's exciting about now, this to me science is the fact that there is theology in it. There there certainly, there's theology, theology and everything, based, based on the fact of viewpoint. bombing Japan with candy. I like that. I like that. Science fantasy. <laughs> Make a small hole, but impressive. You, you, yeah, may, you may use it if you give me credit. <laughs> <laughs> are, 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 Gandhy is dandy, but liquor is sweet. <laughs> are, there, are there people... Are, are the movies now... It seems to me that right now, uh, in the public mind, a lot of things about whatever you call this. I don't like the word speculative fiction because that sounds like you're writing on speculative, on terms. Like, I'll write it and turn it in. We and usually maybe you'll pay yeah. for it, maybe you won't. <laughs> we do that, that a lot. That, 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 that bothers a writer, <laughs> doing it on spec, as we call it. But, but, but now a lot of people associate this with, the, with Hollywood movies of one sort mm. or another, yeah. uh, which seem to me partly not science, fantasy, science fiction, but just special effects to, to a great extent. You have just spoken the key word as far as visual, the visual mm -hmm. media concerned. If they don't have special effects, they don't want it. If you, if you subtracted the special effects from some of these movies, there'd be nothing. Nothing left. Nothing there'd be left. Nothing. They're, they're, not, they're not conceptually science fantasy or science fiction or speculative fiction. They're, they're, they're simply, uh, this is a question, although it doesn't sound like one, they're simply stories with a lot of special effects laid on. Now, well, take Alien, for instance. If you took away all the excitement of whether the alien is going to jump you or get inside you or something, what's left? It's just the inside of a spaceship that looks like a haunted castle. Right. Well, so you might as well have a haunted castle. People who make these science fiction movies insist upon having explosions in the vacuum of space where there is no sound because they say, well, the audience demands it. 
What they're saying is, we have made this audience stupid. We have distanced them from reality, and we're going to continue to keep them stupid by continuing to have explosions in space. But that's, that's the invidious nature of these films. Because in, in one of your stories, or in any of you in a way, you would demand that there's some kind of internal consistency in it. Absolutely. All right. I mean, that, that, that even though we suspend our disbelief because we know there isn't any robot of that sort or, or that little man like that, that, that everything else falls into place right. You need all sorts of little things in a good science fiction story which play no direct role in the plot, but lend an air of plausibility and verisimilitude to the society you're describing. If you have a society which has robots, or ipso facto, you have to have a society which is different from ours in many small ways. So that, so that the, the little details that you're adding aren't necessarily uh, details from our world, but de details that, that kind of uh, stabilize the world you're talking about. Well, so if you have robots, I grow out of that. Well, right. here, let me give you an example, too. Right. I had my characters land in a different world. One of the characters is a novice. He's never been in any world other than his own. He gets off, he says, it's space here. Well, of course it does. They've got a different vegetation. It's got a different odor. He's not used to the odor. It smells funny. The other guy tells, don't worry about it. Take a deep breath. In one hour, you won't notice it. And when you come back to our own world, you'll find that thing. And it does. And it will. I'm sure of it, you see. But although that does not play a part in the plot, it's the reader can't help but feel that this has got to be real. Because if it weren't real, nobody would think of this. Right. You see. And therefore, he accepts all sorts of things that are a lot harder to swallow because you give him something that's easy to swallow and he hasn't thought. And also kind of pedestrian in a way, what it's right. like. Right. Uh, you know, this is going to sound things. pretentious as though I'm stroking you three. But I, to the to me, you guys are doing what Einstein urged people to do before he died. He says the world has jumped so much technologically and scientifically, the leap, really quantum, but man, in relation to fellow man, has not. And unless they change an attitude, you know, with nas crazy nationalism, whatever it is, catastrophe, basically. So it's just, and you guys are talking about that kind of leap. Yeah. Like people behaving a certain, oh, the robots. There aren't there three laws for the robots in your book, I, Robot? Yes, there are. And one is not to hurt anybody, right? The first law. What? Not to hurt human beings. Because we can hurt robots. So therefore, a person who is a stranger could be a robot to us. Russian, Chinese, Salvadorian. In the most recent robot story I wrote, The Bicentennial Man, I spent a good deal of time trying to make the point that if a robot is not allowed to harm you, then the least you can do is not harm the robot. Wow. Well, you really, uh, this is pretty serious literature, isn't it? Comes down to that. It's not if you're on the wrong uh, rack, it's not. Huh? It's on the wrong yeah. rack and... Mm -hmm. Of the respectable capital R critics got a way to go, haven't they? Well, listen, we, we have to be realistic, too. Science fiction is not what makes it good literature. Like in everything else, uh, there can be rotten science fiction, yeah. too. But uh, there are a great many people who think that something is poor because it is science right. fiction. And that's not so. What happens to one of your books now if, if you write what, what you, by your standards, which are high standards, would be a book that you yourself think is a very good book of science fiction? Thank you for being with us this evening.